Uh, turn to Philippians chapter 1. I'm going to look at three statements the Apostle Paul makes about the gospel um, and hope to come back to these at the end and maybe tie it all together and we'll see how it works. Um, in verse 3 of chapter 1, Paul says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making requests with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from this first day unto now. So Paul talks about fellowship in the gospel. And as you know, Paul is imprisoned as he's writing this letter. And in verse 15, he, he speaks of those who were um, preaching Christ. He says, some preach Christ even of envy and strife, and some also of goodwill. The one preach Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add a, affliction to my bonds. And in verse 17, he says, but the other of love, knowing that I, so Paul, I am set for the defense of the gospel. And then in verse 27, he, he, he tells this church at Philippi, he says, Only let your conversation or your manner of life, your behavior, be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come to see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, and that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Uh, Paul mentions the gospel something like eight or nine times in the book of Philippians. Uh, that, that, that word gospel... It simply means good news. We know that, right? That's what the gospel means, good news. And, and as, as um, the people of God, we should be happy people of God, right? We should be happy, shouldn't we? Um, Y'all know Elder Ricky Harcrow. I remember hearing him at Five Mile Church one time. He says, uh, he says he's preached to some congregations that would be good poker players because <laughs> you never know what they're thinking, right? He said and some of them look like they were weaned on dill pickles. They just got a sour look on their face. Uh, the whole time you're preaching to them. We should be happy people, right? We should smile and laugh. And, and God came that we could have life and life abundantly. I believe the abundant life is a joyful life, right? You don't want to walk around just sad all the time. Um, that's not the life that, that, God, that God came to give us here in this life. You know, there's a life that is eternal that we'll enjoy forever in heaven. And there's a life right here that we can enjoy on earth as we come close to our Lord and as we fellowship around the gospel. It's a good message that's used 98 times in the bible the word gospel is used in 80 of those times it says the gospel he said the gospel of the kingdom or the gospel of jesus christ or the gospel of his son uh, whatever it says it says the gospel and you know if it says the gospel that means there's only one gospel right <laughs> he didn't say a gospel or one of the gospels it never says that it says the gospel over and over, and Paul says your fellowship's in the gospel, that I'm set for the defense of the gospel. He says that, that you want your conversation to be in a way that becometh the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's only one gospel. When Christ was on the, uh, getting ready to go back to heaven and he looks to his disciples, he says, go into all the world and preach, what, a gospel, one of the gospels, some of the gospels, preach the gospel, right? There's only one gospel that we're here to preach. It's the gospel. <clears throat> and so you might want to know, what is the gospel? Uh, um, and I hope that, that none of this is new to you today, but turn to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15 and we get a, a good definition of what the gospel is. Paul is writing to a church that has a lot of problems in this church. And, and uh, Brother Sam has said before, who would, who would offer to pastor uh, this church at Corinth? And in verse 15, he's going to start reminding them about the thing that keeps unity in the church, and that's the gospel. And he says in verse 1 of chapter 15, Moreover, brethren, uh, more other brothers, sisters, those who have been redeemed by God, that have confessed Christ, that have been baptized. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you, there it goes again, the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand. So Paul's reminding them of something he's already told them, right? The gospel. He says, the one that I preached unto you, the one that you received, uh, the, the one that you now stand in. And then he says in verse 2, by which you are saved if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. Uh, you know what that verse says, that you can believe in vain. Does that mean you're a false believer and you never were a child of God? No, right? But you can, you can believe in Christ. You can believe the gospel. You can, uh, you, can, you can do these things in a vain way that really means nothing to you, right? That's what he's saying. But he's saying here, I, I, I want you to remember, uh, I want you to keep in memory, I want you to retain this in your memory, the gospel by which you're saved. And you know, the gospel can save you uh, each and every day, right? Brother Sam talked about the world we live in today, and it is a, a world that is um, 
We're bombarded with, with sin. We're bombarded uh, with temptation. We're bombarded uh, with, with maybe uh, not fitting in at school or not fitting in at work or all those things that apparently the, the first century Christians uh, had the same thing because Peter told them uh, not to be weary in that. We're bombarded with all this and there's only one thing that's going to keep you on the straight and narrow that's going to keep you, deliver you in this life and it's the gospel. That's what Paul's saying to them. <clears throat> he, he's, he's, right here he's saying this is a, this is a temporal salvation that takes place in time if you believe the gospel and you know that's that's the good thing about um, uh, being a primitive baptist preacher uh, i mentioned preaching in the afternoon a good thing about being a primitive baptist preacher is we don't have and brother sam you can amen this and being a primitive baptist in general is we do not have the pressures that are laid upon us by the doctrines of men in this world to save people for heaven we can rejoice in the finished work of jesus christ right but, but guess what, folks? We do have a burden on us that we can, we can save people right here and right now, right? And may God open doors for us that we could save those in Birmingham uh, to a knowledge of his finished work and to the grace of God that they could rest with us. You know, a lot of times we talk about loving to rest. That doesn't mean you don't do anything, right? But it does mean you're resting while you're doing it. Don't y'all like to be at rest while you're doing it? <laughs> uh, I, I, I like to rest in the finished work of Jesus Christ. He says, for I delivered unto you, first of all, he's going to talk about this is the gospel. For I delivered unto this church at Corinth, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. You know, that's part of the gospel, is it not? That we were sinners, that we, that we needed a savior, that we couldn't do it ourselves, that we, there was nothing in us, there was no one around us, that even God looked and there was no one else that could save, but God in his mercy and his grace and his son to save us. That's the gospel, isn't it? He says, for how, how Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. You know, when, you, when, you're, when you're made to see your sin and you're made to know your sin and, and when you're born again and you, and you know that you need something that you do not have, is it not a glorious, good message when you finally hear that there is one that died for your sins? That's good, isn't it? Uh, when there is one that took your place, there is one that was the substitute for you. There was one who was righteous. There was one who was undefiled. But yet he, in, in, in grace and love for you, went and died where, and, and paid what you could never do. <laughs> that's good news, isn't it? And that, that's what Paul's saying. Here's the gospel. Then he continues on with the gospel. He says, and that he was buried. So here's this Christ that paid for your sins according to the scripture. It says, and he was buried. And he didn't stay buried. It says that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Uh, isn't that good news that this one that came to pay for your sins? Um, you know, if he was, if, if, this wouldn't have been good news if they just said how that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture and was buried and is still there today and you can go see his tomb. That wouldn't be good news, was it? No, it let's go to Romans chapter 4 real quick. Let's just check this, this verse out. If you don't remember anything I say today, remember this. Speaking of Jesus Christ. It says in verse 25, who was delivered for our offenses. I love this verse of scripture. I've got it highlighted in my Bible. It says Jesus Christ, listen to that, that's good news, isn't it? Jesus Christ was delivered for our offenses. You're an offender. You have offended the holy God of this universe. And it says, but Jesus was delivered because of or for your offenses. Then, in, then there's, a, there's, a, there's a comma and it says, and, and this Jesus was raised again for our justification. What does that mean? That his resurrection justified us? No. His, his, his sacrifice on the cross is what justified us. And his, his resurrection or the fact that he rose from the grave is proof positive that God the Father accepted the sacrifice he made. Isn't that good news? I love that. He said he was delivered for our offenses and that he was raised again for or because of our justification. That's what it means. He was raised again because his children were justified. It wasn't a potential justification that they may find if they run into the preacher and get the right message and make the decision to do what God told them to do. That wasn't what it was. They were justified right then and right there. Right? That's good news, isn't it? They were justified in the sight of God. So Paul keeps going. He says he was raised again according to the scriptures. And then he says this, and that he was seen of Cephas, and then of the twelve. And after that he was seen about five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present. But some are fallen asleep. After that he was seen of James, then of the apostles. And last of all he was seen of me as one born out of due time. So here Paul tells us what the gospel is. The gospel message is that Jesus died for your sins. Jesus was buried for your sins. Jesus rose again because he, he successfully paid for your sins. And Jesus is alive today. <laughs> That's part of the gospel message, isn't it? It's not just that he died, not just that he rose, but he's alive and just as active today as he was when he was living on this earth. That means he can help you when you need help, right? That means that you can, you can talk to him when you need somebody to talk to. Uh, that, that, that means he's a present help in time of need. 
Jesus died, Jesus arose from the grave, and Jesus is alive today. Boy, that, uh, once, once the apostles finally got that, you know, it took them a little while, too, even after they saw him alive. Uh, sometimes, you know, sometimes we can, we can be real hard on ourselves, but if you go back, Scripture's so honest uh, with the people that it portrays and the people that it, that it shows us. Uh, even the apostles, after they'd seen him, they still said, well, we'll just go fishing again, right? <laughs> so don't be so hard on yourself, right? But once it clicked in Peter's mind, he says, I was begotten to get into a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It finally clicked with him, and it changed his life. And then they would say in Thessalonica, these are the men that have turned the world upside down. What was, what was their motivation that Jesus was alive and that Jesus had done what he came to do? So that's the message of the gospel in its, in its simplest form. The message is that Jesus died for our sins, that he arose again because he accomplished the sacrifice for our sins, and he's living today to make intercession for you. You know, it's important that we preach the gospel. Remember we said that the gospel? Uh, one time I remember um, someone asked on a message board that, that I was in, a kind of internet thing, said, how many apostles were there? And, you know, that's a debate among Christianity where there, how many actual apostles were there? And a man that I highly esteem, I don't know him that well, Elder Vernon Johnson said, I, I don't know how many there were, but I know how many there were to the Gentiles, because Paul said, I'm the apostle to the Gentiles. <laughs> there can't be more than one, can there? If he said he was the man, <laughs> he was the one. Well, here Paul says that, um, that there's the gospel. And look at, look at Galatians chapter 1. We talk about the importance of this gospel. Why are you such a stickler for there's one kind of gospel? Uh, because even though we're in 2018 and we live in a politically correct society and we live in an ecumenical church uh, culture where everybody, well, there's, there's, you know, you do it your way and I'll do it my way, but we're one family. Well, that's just simply not true based on the Bible, right? Uh, the, um, I believe it was, um, there was a famous preacher in the last few weeks that said, uh, uh, you know, he said, he said, unity is more important uh, than, than doctrine. Did y'all see that on the news? He said, it's more important that we be united and I want to be united. But did you know that doctrine's uh, one of its one of the one of the main things that 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 the Bible does is divide people. <laughs> Even Jesus said that he came that he would he would he would divide uh, people. He said I didn't come to bring peace. At one point he said that uh, doctrine divides people, and that's just a fact of life. And so our job as children of God is to find uh, where is the church that God has deposited His truth into. You know, the church is supposed to be the the pillar and ground of the truth, right? So our job is to find that church and to join that church and to be a blessing to that church, right? And if, and if you don't think it's here, we'll go look for it somewhere else. But I'm going to stay here because <laughs> I think I finally found it. What about y'all? I think I found it. And it's important. You say, well, is the gospel really that important? Uh, Galatians chapter 1, Paul says, Grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God. And our Father, that's the gospel, isn't it? That, that Jesus gave himself for us to deliver us from this present evil world. To whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And then Paul says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ into another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which was preached unto you, let him be accursed. Did y'all hear that? Paul says, though, though I preach, or Peter preaches, or Thomas preaches, or James preaches, or, or, or better than that, let's up the ante. If an angel comes down from heaven and preaches another gospel unto you, then that which you've received, let him be accursed. That's pretty strong language, isn't it? You know, I like to buy little banners and put them outside the church, hoping that somebody will stop in one day, and uh, maybe they'll be saved to a, to, a, to a knowledge of the truth of Jesus Christ. And it hadn't worked yet, but you know, I might be tempted if, um, if I could get an angel on the phone and I could say, you know, that'd be a good banner, wouldn't it? Come in Saturday night to Vestavia Primitive Baptist Church. We're having Gabriel preach the message that night. He's bringing his trump. We're even going to have music that night in the church. We're going to have musical instruments. He's brought his trumpet. Well, the, what Paul's saying here, if that was even possible in this Gabriel or whatever other angel from heaven was going to preach a different uh, gospel than that we've received, he says, don't even have him. Amen. Y'all see that? He says, I say before, so say I now again, if any man... Preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received. Let him be accursed. I would say Paul thought it was pretty important uh, to preach the gospel, right? Uh, and you can't leave without um, Brother Steve Wilkinson preached a great message from 2 Timothy chapter 1. Uh, but until you just get real clear on the purpose of the gospel, 2 Timothy chapter 1. 
the Apostle Paul is writing to Timothy in the last epistle that he'll write, and he says in verse 8, Be not thou for, for ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel, according to the power of God, who hath saved us, and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. But now, listen to what Paul was saying, but now, uh, what, what God had done before in times past, what God had done from the foundation of the world, now, now, <laughs> and that would continue into 2018, guys. Uh, right now, Timothy, it has been made manifest. How? how, how, did, how that, that means made clear, right? Um, y'all know what that means. Have y'all ever, sometimes I'll do this, uh, sometimes, not all the time, about 5% of the time, my children's ears stop working. I don't know what happens. Sometimes I'll say, do I need to take you to the ear doctor? Because uh, they can't hear. And every once in a while, I'll, I'll find myself saying this. Let me be clear. <laughs> you know, and usually they'll listen at that point. That's what Paul's saying here. That's what God said. Uh, you know, God had chosen us from before the world began. God intended to save us. God was going to send his son uh, to justify us. And, and all that was planned before the world ever began. But when Jesus came and was born of a virgin uh, in, 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 to a poor family, you know what that was? God was saying, let me be clear. I plan to do what I said I was going to do. Praise God. But now it was made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Then he says, who hath abolished death. Who abolished death? Christ abolished death. Death has been abolished. That's good news, isn't it? That's part of the gospel, isn't it? Death has been abolished. I like over and over in the Bible it says they went to sleep and they went to sleep and they went to sleep. I used to ask my dad when I was a little boy, I said, what, what's it, what will it be like when we die? And he'd say, it'd just be like taking a nap. I don't know if that's true, but it made me feel good when I was a kid. I don't know what it's going to be like, but I know it's going to be good. And I know that those who are in Christ are just asleep until the resurrection morning. But he says that Jesus has abolished death. And then listen to this. And hath brought life and immortality to light through the, T-H-E, gospel. Y'all see that? How is life and immortality really brought to light? How do you really see it? Through just any, through just any message? No. Paul says through the gospel. Um, that, that, that word um, light, where it says life and immortality brought to light, uh, I'm not a Greek scholar by any stretch of the imagination. It's like um, uh, photozeo is, is, I think, how you say it. And, and I wrote this definition down. It, 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 it just means light, but it comes from the family of words where we get our word photograph. Y'all know what a photograph is, right? Y'all see that in the, in the Greek word itself. It's P-H-O-T-I-Z-O. So you can see photo is kind of in there, right? And so I did some, some digging uh, did y'all know the first photograph was taken in 1826? You can find a lot on Google, <laughs> just Googling something. I was going to just say this and make y'all think I was so smart, but I Googled it. Um, the word photograph was coined in 1839, and it came from, from, from really the two Greek words that meant light. So photo means light, and graph is an instrument for recording, right? So think about old-timey photographs. There'd be a pshh, there's a pop, and then you had to sit there for like three hours, right, while it got your... I mean, that's what it was. That's, you know, when you think about these pictures of these old presidents or whatever, it took a, it took a long time to get those. Now, now, did the light, did the photo, did it have anything to do with what the graph was, was recording? It didn't, did it? It just showed what was there, right? Do y'all see that? That's the same thing the gospel does. It's the flash that shows you what is already there. That's good news, isn't it? That's good. The, the gospel doesn't bring life and immortality. Jesus Christ did that. Uh, but, 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 but the gospel is the light so that you can record that life and immortality that's already there. Let's go back to Philippians and I'll, I'll close as we look at these three things that I think are very important that Paul mentions in this first chapter of this letter to Philippians. He says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you always in every prayer of mine for you all making requests with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day unto now. We know that this church was started at a, at a prayer meeting on a creek bank, and, and Paul is saying, I am thanking God. And I say this, I've said this before here, and I'll say it again. 
And don't y'all want to be the kind of church that when the minister thinks of you, he says, I think, I thank God upon every remembrance of you. I'm not saying, oh, goodness, upon every remembrance of you. <laughs> I want to be the kind that this is, I thank God for him. I thank God for her. And, and, and in every prayer, you know, it's easy. <laughs> it is e Brother Sam was saying there's some people that are hard to get along with. And that's true. But, you know, you know, it's it's. Don't you want to be the kind of person that it's easy to make prayers for them? And, and that people want to pray for you. and People look forward to praying for you. And he says, here's why. Because of your fellowship in the gospel from the first day unto now. This church, they had a common interest in this church at Philippi. And it was the propagation of the gospel. Do you all see that? He's saying, I'm, I'm thanking God. Because you're not just sitting around. Uh, just want to come to church on Sunday, you're, you're, you are zealous for the gospel. The, the number one primary responsibility of the church is what? To give glory to God. God set up his church as a place where he would get glory on earth, right? Is he going to get it at the ball fields? Is he going to get it at the, at, the, at the movie theater? No. And, and, and Paul is saying, I am so thankful that you have joined in participation with me for the gospel and the spreading of the gospel. And he's saying your, your common interest, what is it that sets the church apart from, from other organizations? Is it the common